hope so. Um, so. This session, as you will know, is on Scotland, and the question is independence inevitable? Um, we have two speakers, both of them online, um, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Kirsty Hughes, who was the founder and director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations. Um, she's a writer, she's a commentator on European and international politics, um, and she's an associated fellow at the Centre for Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh, uh, as well as another group, the Friends of Europe in Brussels. So Kirsty, I hope we'll be able to hear you. Would you like to start? Yes, I, I hope you can hear me, otherwise I, <laughs> it will be less of a debate. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'll try and keep my comments brief to, to make up some time here. Um, I think, I think the, the title, the question of, in this session is, is one of those ones um, designed for a, an obvious answer at one level, you know, is, you know there's, there's some things that are inevitable in life, but not necessarily that many. So um, as my top line answer to the question, the answer is simply, I think it's probable uh, but not inevitable. And if it's probable, then it's a question of how, when, and the implications of that for, for the future, um, both of the rest of the UK and for the relationship of the rest of the UK or England and Wales um, with an independent Scotland. Um, I think it, it's maybe worth at the start just stating one or two, I hope, obvious things, because the independence debate can often generate a lot more heat than light, um, in, in theory at least, our, our major political parties would, when pushed, uh, agree that the UK is a voluntary union. Um, I don't think they agree, neither the Conservatives nor Labour in practice, um, but it, it's <laughs> interesting and, and significant to our discussion today um, that at least in theory, there, there is that acknowledgement it's a voluntary union. And I actually think the the most um, clear politician on this question of a voluntary union uh, in the last year or so, uh, ironically enough, has been Mark Drakeford in Wales, who, who has talked um, periodically with great insight um, about the challenges facing the UK union, um, the, the, the deep challenges he sees um, facing it, the need for change um, if it's not to fall apart, um, and the fact that it's a voluntary union. And, and I think that's very encouraging for a more rational and sober debate that someone who doesn't support independence does, does um, recognize in a much more genuine way than other political parties that it is and must be voluntary. Um, and I think an, another couple of comments as well, just sort of again, trying to step back a little bit from, from some of the heat uh, of the debate is that you don't have to live in Scotland for very long, or perhaps you just don't have to visit it for very long to get a sense of the degree of separateness of Scotland. Obviously it is a country, not a region. It's got its own parliament. It's got its own education and legal system. Um, but I think, I think things that have reinforced that sense of separateness are certainly the devolution process and the fact of having the parliament, um, also having 15 years of an SNP government in Scotland, and also since 2015, as you know, having a big majority of Scottish National Party MPs at Westminster. And I think um, there are various impacts of that, but one of them is that you have uh, in, in the current Conservative governments and previous ones in the last dozen years, all, almost not no Scottish representation um, in the UK government, um, but you certainly haven't got Scotland voting for the party that is governing the UK, which used to be the case when, when Scotland was strongly Labour and there was a Labour government in, in the UK. Um, so I think there is that, that degree of separation which underpins um, a whole range of reasons and arguments why around half the population in Scotland do support independence at the moment. But let me just summarise very briefly some of the current opinion polls. I think in the last couple of years, opinion has basically sat around the 50-50 level. Um, I was looking for some of the most recent statistics for this meeting. Um, for some reason, panel base did two within a, a week. The first one 
7th of October had opinion at 50-50 and the second one, 10th of October had opinion at 48 yes to 52 no. I just want to make three comments about the, the polling numbers and about, and about opinion in, in Scotland. Firstly, what, what you see across all the polls is very striking demographics. So it's younger people who support independence and older people who support the union. This is, this is fluid, the numbers change to some extent, but when I say younger people, I'm also talking about people under around 50 years old, where in some of the recent polls about two thirds support independence. So I'm, I'm not just talking about independence is, is something that, that you know, people of student age support, though their views are, are important and it's younger people who are also most pro-European in Scotland. Um, but you have got a very big demographic divide and I think that's important to take into account when one's thinking about the prospects for the future and also for, especially for, for UK political parties sitting in London, like the, the Tories and Labour, to, to think about their language when they're talking about independence, given that um, two thirds or, or in, in some polls over 70% of under 35 support independence. So, so, so this is a significant thing to bear in mind. Secondly, um, the middle of opinion is a soft middle. Um, and I think if you look back to two and a half years ago, two to two and a half years ago, um, the second half of 2020, when the pandemic was in full swing and, and before we had any vaccines, there was suddenly uh, a strong uptick in support for independence. Uh, it persisted for six months. Um, we had numbers from 52 to 54 to in one poll 59%. Um, supporting independence. Uh, and, and that was clearly to do with the pandemic and Nicola Sturgeon turning up at press conferences every, every day and looking calm and in control compared to uh, perceptions of Boris Johnson in London. So their potential is there for big, for big swings, excuse me. My third point on, on the polls, uh, which again, because I think a lot of you are going to be interested in the European dimension of this, there is a strong correlation between those who support yes and those who supported remain remaining in the European Union and equally between people who would vote no to independence and voted leave in 2016. And the interesting thing about this is it wasn't there in 2016. So you'd had the 2014 referendum, then you had the Brexit vote, and there wasn't a, a differentiation between where the yes and no voters went, but that has changed in the last um, six years. One other general comment, um, I don't know if David will agree with this, but I think, I think if people in Scotland, if voters thought uh, that the economics of independence was okay, and if they thought they can rejoin the European Union, then it would be a clear yes. Uh, so, so the fact that it's at 50-50 and, and that in, in 2014 it was 55-45 is a lot to do with head, not heart, as you might put it. So, so there isn't that strong a political buy-in to the UK. Um, it's more an uncertainty about some, some of the economic implications. Interestingly, but it's very early days, we haven't seen much of an uptick in support for independence over trust. Yet we've seen a Tory to Labour voter shift in Scotland, which is what you'd expect, but the SNP vote is holding up. There's no particular reason why SNP voters should shift to Labour just because the Tories are proving disastrous. Um, we've also then got, going back to my point at the start about voluntary union, um, we've got the debate about when and whether there should be another referendum. The, the, refer the SNP have got a case at the Supreme Court to ask if they can test the waters through a referendum run through Holyrood. Um, the hearing has happened, but we don't have the judgment yet. It will take a few months. <clears throat> and I would, and, and that if that, most lawyers seem to expect that case to be lost, but some say it could be won. And if it's won, Nicola Sturgeon has said there'll be a referendum in October next year. Um, I certainly think it's very hard to say there's no 
democratic mandate for a referendum, given the SNP has been in government for so long, its partners in Hollywood, the Greens at the moment, have all been very clear they want another referendum. Um, but they're clearly not also going to have London's agreement any time soon for a referendum. And, and that led Nicola Sturgeon to say, well, she was going to run the next general election as some sort of um, quasi referendum. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if she does do that. It's pe some people have called that a silly strategy. I, I, I think it's a political strategy. Um, it won't produce independence like a, an agreed London Edinburgh referendum would. Um, but I think I think it's a serious political strategy, but it's also a very risky one. What, what if they got 48 or 49 percent of the vote? It's not going it's going to not give political impetus. It's going to do the opposite. Um, but I, th I think, you know, when we saw how the debate in London changed, when the support for independence went into the sort of over 50s two years ago, then I think it's the political dynamics as much as the legal situation that needs to change if, if we are to see a referendum at some point. Well, I don't want to say too much more, but let me just say, make a couple of comments about whether an independent Scotland can join, could join the European Union, because um, it's quite central in a lot of the debate, although it's also, again, worth remembering in 2014, 45% of people voted uh, for independence, even with the, the no side saying, oh, but you might be out of the EU. Um, this is obviously a topic we could have a whole day's conference on. So my very brief answer is, yes, of course, an independent Scotland could join the European Union. We've seen 22 countries join the European Union already in its history. Obviously, it's a political and technical process and you have to meet the criteria. And I think the SNP and Scottish government have been pretty clear on this. They accept that they would face a normal EU accession. They're not looking for special treatment. They're not looking to come in overnight. But my, my own view, having looked into this quite a bit, is that, uh, of course, there are EU member states who don't particularly want to see the UK fall apart. But if there was a legal and constitutional referendum agreed between London and Edinburgh and Scotland chose independence, is there going to be a big problem for a 5 million population North European democracy market economy joining the EU? No, no, I don't think so. Now, of course, there will be questions about currency, which we can pick up in, in the debate and Q&A, questions about deficit. So they will impact on timing. But it's it's quite hard to me to see how, how it would take um, much more than, say, four to five years, unless there were major problems on deficit, when you look at how long other countries took, including the Central and East Europeans. Um, there are big issues around the border. The recent Scottish government uh, economics paper that came out a couple of weeks ago did give better detail and acknowledgement of some of the challenges if there was an EU border between Scotland and England, but it certainly didn't give a, a full overview of those questions. So I, when I'm saying I think independence is probable, um, I'm not saying there's a watertight case or that the, the Scottish government have answered all the questions. Clearly, clearly they haven't, and I'm assuming David's going to come on to some of that. So let me, let me just conclude. Um, if Scotland could jump to being like Ireland, you know, Ireland in the EU, a pretty good economy with, with all, all its challenges, I think it would. You know, if you if you could set up a referendum and say, do you want to be Ireland in effect? I think I think they'd get a majority vote. But of course, the problem is it might take 10 years or 15 years to to get anywhere like that. And the big question in all the big debates, in my mind, around independence is to do with the transition. How do you transition to your own currency, to, to managing your deficit, to managing your border, to joining the European Union and so on and so forth? So. Inevitable, no, likely, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll take our, our next speaker first and, um, and then we'll move to an open debate. Um, so the next speaker is David Gall, uh, who is a, a member of Federal Press Council, an editor of Skeptical.Scot, which I admit I haven't read. I'm just going to have a look at it. Um, uh, senior Advisor at Social Europe and Senior Advisor at Ackerman Public Affairs. Um, he's a former European business editor of The Guardian and has also worked for The Scotsman and London Weekend Television. So, um, 
David, um, we'll get you on the screen. Can we do that? I think David needs to start. Oh, it's speaking. when you start speaking, it will put you on the screen. Yeah. And um, um, there we are. And there we are. Is, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thanks, to, uh, thanks to Kirsty for setting it, setting up the, uh, you know, the context, the kind of context. So, um, a well, I, I actually joined the Scotsman in 1968 as a uh, when that paper was uh, uh, supported the concept of a federal UK uh, within which there would be much greater Scottish autonomy, and uh, I wrote leaders as a young kind of graduate trainee in that spirit. I mean, obviously, devolution. Uh, came and the Scottish Parliament was uh, came thirty years later. You no, know, nay federalism. Uh, I mean, the English basically, and we'll hear about that later, were simply uninterested, uh, if not appalled. And now, fifty years later, what are the prospects for the federal UK, as we are asking today? Uh, are these Scottish independence ineluctable or inevitable? As the question asked, uh, Kirsty's already said no, and I agree with that. She says it's likely. Um, as I say here, I hear me doots. Anyway, so uh, there's no sense to my mind anyway that independence is inevitable yet. And recent events, including this third paper in the Scottish government series on called Building a New Scotland, this time on the uh, economy and currency, that and it seems to be underlines that. Um, if anything, and despite this, and, and, and this is despite the self-harming chaos that was afflicted. Uh, the ruling party in, in, in the UK, Westminster, and the entirely negative uh, economic uh, effects of Brexit, that still remains true. Uh, so few of any, part you, this audience and, uh, and our host are arguing the case for full-blown federalism in the UK. The elephant in the room, England, has become, if in a sense, even bigger. Uh, and this is certainly the case in, in, in Scotland, but in, this, in, in Scotland, you know, certainly, there is a discussion and debate about the merits of thinking beyond the crude binary divide between independence and unionism. That is starting, is stirring. And that's a lot to do with the patchy performance and failings of the SNP and the government for over the last 15 years. Uh, but also, I think the, uh, you know, with the uh, case for independence itself, as we shall see, and there is, I think, a sense of, uh, you know, um, anger, at what's going on both in, 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 in here in Scotland and, um, and and more particularly in the UK as a whole. And so there is an interest in looking, I think, beyond the constitution to consider a radically changed economic and political model, including for intra-UK relations. Anyway, so why not independence? Well, kirsty has gone through some of the polling results, polling figures, and you know, I would, I, I, and I agree with that, that, it, you know, we're basically faced with a 50-50 uh, situation here. Um, and, and if, of course, if you add the kind of, you know, within within the parliament support, the SNP is around 45 to 47 percent. And uh, if you add it over the Scottish Greens, you might just as what you would get over probably around about 50 percent or even not over 50 percent in the election. <laughs> and that's a democratic mandate, according to Nicola Sturgeon like the one they won in 2021. So I find this a bit flimsy and unstable, uh, a bit like the Brexit result. And Sturgeon herself, of course, always asked for at least 60% support. So there is, too, some evidence of a Labour revival in England spreading to Scotland. Uh, Labour, if it's to win a majority in Westminster, needs to win about 25 seats here. On current polling, it would get about seven, uh, made, mainly from the SNP. But Basically, you know, the great psychologist John Curtis says that Labour's winning over former Tory voters, and, and Kirsty mentioned this too, but relatively few SNP voters. So, uh, you know, so to that extent, you know, there, there's neither, the, the situation is like, you know, very, very fluid. We don't know where we are yet. So, uh, uh, Sturgeon, uh, I need Blackford in Westminster, and, and, and the SNP as a whole, they basically say there's only with independence can Scotland be greener, fairer, and more prosperous. And they, you know, they have a go. The Tories, of course, for promoting inequality, austerity, stagflation, poverty, recession, etc. And in, in the in her foreword to the latest paper, a Scottish government papers, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon says, it's never been clearer today than it is 
never been clearer than it is today, Westminster is taking Scotland in the wrong direction. And she goes on and concludes, you know, we now face a choice of two futures, becoming an independent country in which decisions about Scotland's future are made by the people who live here, or accepting continued crisis and control from Westminster. Now, personally, I think there's too many elements here which are being deliberately confused. The first is obviously the widely shared revulsion in Scotland about the socio-economic direction of travel chosen by the Conservative-led government since 2010. Uh, the second is revulsion about the political choices of the Tories, including a hard Brexit and the power grab, which undermines devolution. The third is nothing will change, even with a different government in Westminster, with Labour tarred, I think, somewhat half-heartedly with the same brush. Fourth, all that goes wrong in Scotland, or virtually everything, is laid at the door of the Tories. Fifth, rarely if ever is there any admission that the Scottish government could have used what powers it has to strike out on a different path, or at the very least mitigate the socio-economic crisis rather than do so at the margins. I mean, it's almost as if the SNP needs the Tories to remain in power to make the case for Indy even stronger. And as one commentator has put it, the biggest drive towards independence will be continued Tory rule by an increasingly right wing and increasingly English government, which is quite a powerful case. Anyway, so Surgeon says that the case for independence is the ambition, note, note not the plan, to improve the lives, well-being and future prospects of the people of Scotland, and that this is impossible under Westminster rule. However, that detailed case has not been made. We can all agree that intrinsically, Scotland can be like Slovakia or Denmark or Ireland, indeed, as Kirsty says, the great lodestar here, and be an independent state, a member of the EU in its own right. Ireland, indeed, as it is the globe star, it's been punching above its weight on the European stage and proving how in a dynamic model, a small country can move from economic subservience to its much bigger neighbour, likely in this case England, to overtaking it in terms of income and output per head. Scotland is not there yet. The 2022 papers, critics inside the Yes movement say, mark a regression compared with the even the uh, 2018 Sustainable Growth Commission or indeed the pre ndref uh, white paper of 2013. As uh, James, Professor James Mitchell says, you have to make a credible case for independence. That's not being done, whether in terms of the fiscal model or currency or monetary policy or indeed trade, including the border with England. And I think, you know, the the thinking in the SNP and the Scottish government is too much wishful thinking. It's reliant on the kindness of estranged near neighbours. Uh, and, uh, and in the case of the EU27, no willingness... Well, anyway, let's forget about that. So, so is there another kind of UK that kind of want to imagine? The binary choice, it seems to be, between the need to independence versus the status quo, status quo is increasingly viewed, notably in, in, in parts of the social democratic pro-European left, of which I would consider myself to be a member, as stale and even fake. Why not, as Mitchell puts it, start by asking what kind of society do we want? And then what political and economic model is the best way of achieving that? If the current independence first model fails to convince, so does the false unionist togetherness. So why not think in terms of perhaps progressive solidarity. Let's first imagine, to my mind, a different kind of polity. No more first past the, vote, uh, first past the post voting in the electoral system, a shift to PR, and with it regular constant coalition government in all probability, abolish the House of Lords in its entirety, and replace it with a Bundesrat style, a much smaller body of elected representatives from the nations and regions of the UK, perhaps in excluding Northern Ireland, uh, because it may well rejoin the uh, 26 counties uh, in the United Ireland eventually. I personally would get rid of the monarchy in favour of the Republic, though I accept that's a minority position. I'd like you to stay so for some time. And certainly there should be much greater powers given to local and regional mayors in England, and, you know, and, and there should be the creation of an, an assembly of regional entities en route to federalism. So in Scotland, uh, that would also require, we talked uh, in the first session a bit about centralization of power, and that is the case up here. 
in Scotland, I would create a an elected second chamber <clears throat> to exercise genuine checks and balances over an increasingly over mighty executive, reform the weak committee system, which is in the Scottish Parliament, giving them greater powers to hold the government to account, devolve far more powers to local government and even local communities to run their own affairs, including borrowing powers. And the Scottish current Scottish model is far too conservative and failed to deliver the promised social and economic outcomes by disempowering too many people. So, and Kirsty's referred to this, of course, the key question economically, as well as politically, is rejoining the EU after the evidence of self-harming and impoverishment that Brexit has brought. Rejoin the EU. Rejoining the EU is umbilically tied now to the case for Scottish independence. But if the UK were to enact this, of course, border issues would go away. Anyway, Scotland does need freedom of movement and power over immigration policy for demographic and economic reasons above all. Anyway, so even, in, even with the removal of the opt-outs, the UK inside the EU would ultimately be better off. Uh, personally, I think there should be a kind of a, a completely revamped uh, fiscal model away from taxes on employment to eco taxes, uh, taxes on land and so on and so forth. Anyway, so a radical shake up. So in my case, of course, plenty of wishful thinking here too. Uh, but given the, the UK's decline and Scotland's not weakness, I think seems to me not too wee, too small, too weak, uh, but lack of preparedness. Uh, that's one of the deepest disappointments. A federal solution or confederal solution combined with a different economic model may be desirable and even necessary. Uh, would a change of government in, in Westminster hasten that process? Well, it doesn't look like it so far. So despite Gordon Brown's plans and signs, as we said, signs of disenchantment um, uh, with the SNP performance in government. But I'm personally even more convinced of the need for radical change almost 50 years after writing my youthful contribution to the Red Paper on Scotland in 1975. Indeed, if I were 30 again, or even 50, because Kirsty thinks 50 is young, uh, I certainly would opt for independence. As many as 80% of young people living in Scotland share that view. This is not simply because being Scots and European has a much greater pull these days than British identity, but because the young have no faith in the UK state and government delivering the kind of economy and society they want. So sharing that view now, however, prompts this you know, seasoned observer, as we call ourselves, to consider ways of marrying Scottish autonomy, home rule, with genuine solidarity among the peoples of these islands. And if that means federalism, all be it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, can I ask you uh, if you're uh, making comments or questions to speak fairly loudly? Mm -hmm. And I will check with the speakers if they've actually heard you. And if not, I'll repeat it for them. So who would like to start? <clears throat> I'll make a comment myself, which is that uh, um, what strikes me is how in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, the demands for Irish independence came to have a huge impact on British politics and the British Parliament. And now a century later, we're having similar impacts um, from the demands for Scottish independence and how things have moved on. Andrew. Just a question to both speakers, really. I, I think that once upon a time, it used to be argued that uh, Scotland could become independent if there was a majority of uh, Scottish MPs elected to the UK Parliament uh, who favoured independence. So really, I'm harking back to the discussion I, I helped encourage in the earlier session. Uh, now, it's assumed it has to be done by a referendum, a referendum which might well yield the the familiar 52-48 result that, that, that seems to be uh, such a great way of resolving it. Is there another way of doing it other than by a referendum? <laughs> Did you hear the question? Yeah. Um, 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 David, would you like to start and, and then Kirsty? Well, I mean, as, as we say, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the Scottish government, the SNPs, uh, Basically, say that if there is a, uh, you know, there was a, there is a already a democratic mandate 
for independence, and that was given in the 2021 Scottish elections when they won a majority of the seats in the Scottish Parliament. So that is that is that is one way. But certainly, uh, there is undoubtedly they will move to uh, you know they they hope to get the approval of the Supreme Court. Um, on, and move towards a referendum. I don't think that I can't see any any suggestion yet that there would be an alternative to holding a referendum of some description. And of course, if the, if it were to be, it has to be uh, legal. It has to be agreed uh, with 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 Westminster. Otherwise, you know, uh, the prospects of joining the EU go out the window. Uh, there's no chance of joining the EU. Unless you have, you know, a fully agreed and legal referendum backing that proposition. Thank you, Kirsty. Yes, um, just a, a quick comment first, David, on on your comment about Irish independence and its impact on on England. Um, you know, all, all that time ago, because I I think going back to my point about the sustained majority for independence in that six months in the second half of 2022 was mm. one of the things I found interesting was was the sort of debate it started to provoke in London about oh what is England and what will we look like I mean Scotland's only it's a big part of the UK's landmass it's only eight percent of the population so England and Wales if that's what's left uh will be a big a big state but it was very intriguing I thought to see um, some some of the better commentators and Gavin Esler wrote a book on on England, you know, start to more urgently consider consider that question. And if we think that Brexit is, uh, you know, was a manifestation of a very damaging English nationalism, you know, that that makes that makes that point as well. So so I think, and that in a sense leads on to my answer to to Andrew because I think. You know, if there was, which at the moment there's clearly not going to be, if there was another referendum like 2014, there, there was no kind of super majority or anything. It was whoever got over 50 percent. And as we know, with Brexit, that, that gives you a big problem of of losers consent. Um, and although although the lodestar here, if you're pro independence, is how do you get to a legal constitutional and and yes, vote to get, as David was saying, you know, international and EU recognition. In the end, it's a, a political and social thing. If when support for independence two years ago hit 59%, if it had stayed there, if we'd had two years now of almost two thirds of the Scottish population, very clearly showing that they decided and that's where they were, the debate across the UK would be very different. Um, and although I don't, I'm not arguing that would have meant uh, the Conservative Prime Minister, whichever one of the many it might might have been, would say mm -hmm. yes. Certainly, actually, with a more reasonable government, like under you know Keir Starmer has said no too. But if you're faced with that sort of political dynamic, I think you're in a very different situation. And so, whether the outcome is then another referendum or a general election or however it might come about. I think if you've shown that there is a clear, settled, relatively settled will, it, it changes the, the practical arguments. And I think, I mean, David Gow um, referred to, you know, the 2021 election to, to the Scottish Parliament. I mean, I think what, what they argued is that that's a mandate for a referendum, not that it's uh, an independence vote per se. Um, and I think that's reasonable. And, and you've had all this row about um, oh, once in a generation, you know, which of course was not in the Edinburgh Agreement in 20, 2012. Yeah. It was a throwaway comment from Alec Salmon, but you, you could understand the Tories as politicians using that. Um, I think it's very important for a future independent Scotland, if that's where it's going, that it has 55% or more, that, that to some extent that it can go, get over some of the demographic divides that I was talking about. Um, yeah. And I think, and I think you know, if Nicola Sturgeon's gambit paid off, if if in a general election in the next two years the SNP and Greens and maybe Alba too got fifty point five percent, does that prove anything? I don't think that would prove anything. If they got forty nine point five, Tories and Labour will say, well, you've had your quasi referendum and it's still a 
still a no. And if they said 50.5, they'd say, look, it's still neck and neck and that, that doesn't add political pressure to us. Whereas if they started campaigning now and could get it to 55% or more, that would change things. And I think what's very interesting is that despite, despite these papers, and there's due to be seven or eight more, I, I understand, including one on the EU and more on borders, there's no real campaigning going on. I mean, there's grassroots activity, but there's no real strategic dynamic campaigning. It's as if they're frightened to go too early in this. Yeah, I think just to add to that, the, the very interesting, I, I said, well, Kirsty had talked about 55. Personally, I think it should be closer to 60 percent. And actually, what's interesting now is that, as you, as we know, that Scotland in, in 2016 on, on the EU question, uh, we voted 62% uh, in favour of, of, of remaining. And, and I think the figures now are way up above, uh, they're, they're above, they're over 70%. But, and as, but as Kirsty says, that is not, that doesn't come with a great sense of kind of dynamic campaigning either. There is no way, I mean, it's just, there is a kind of, I mean, there's a little bit of, that's why I talked about the kind of the move towards a kind of like looking for the third question, if you like, on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the referendum uh, paper, ballot paper, uh, in terms of federalism, or at least, you know, whatever, whatever, however we describe it. I mean, but, you know, there is that going on, but basically we're, we're still faced here with a, with a certain amount of inertia, I mean, political inertia. There is not, and nobody's making the dynamic case for independence linked to membership of the EU, which is what both of us, I think, uh, Kirsty and myself would, would argue for. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering uh, if you would like to join me in speculating about the potential scenario at the time of the next British general election. And we have a situation where instead of a massive majority for Labour, we have not exactly a hung parliament, <coughs> one where the Scottish National Party actually has, if you like, a blocking veto right and could actually bring business in Britain and in the House of Commons to a grinding halt. But I'm thinking here, if you go back 100 years or so, and you look at the Irish model and what happened in the independence there, in the lead up to the First World War, the Home Rule movement became a really serious political issue in Westminster, in fact. It was put on hold during the First World War to some extent, <coughs> and then the whole thing erupted again afterwards. And if you remember from the history books, Ireland became basically ungovernable at that point. And as you know, it led, led to civil war, it led to the separation of the Protestant uh, counties in the north and so on. And you're talking about a sort of absence of political dynamics, if you like, in the whole situation. What would your thoughts be in such a scenario? Do you think that the dynamism for independence in that sense would take hold and light uh, things up in, in Scotland, not necessarily with a referendum, but just posing a completely different set of political facts on the ground? Um, Kirsty, would you like to come in first on that? Sure. Um... I mean, I think so. So you're talking about a hung parliament scenario. There's there's also a rather interesting possible scenario um, if if there's a Labour landslide and, and and the Tories are decimated that the SNP become the official opposition, which would also rather challenge uh, <laughs> the, the the weirdness of the the UK's democratic <clears throat> structures. Um, I think if there was a hung parliament, that's not looking most likely at the moment, but it's a good question. Um, Yes, absolutely, the SNP would use that to, to demand a referendum. Um, and would, you know, if Labour was the largest government and looking for implicit minority support for, for its minority government, you know, Starmer has ruled out any formal deal with the SNP. Um, you know, would, th would, they, would they give that referendum or, or would they just let the SNP bring, bring the government down and straight into another election? And how would the electorate in Scotland react at that point? That also depends, I think, where the opinion polls in Scotland are on independence at that point. So you, you see, 
um, we've not between us, David and I really mentioned the Alba party because the Alba party, you know, has about 0.6% of the vote and, and Salmond can still get headlines, but he's, he's not, he's not um, a serious player in that sense anymore. Um, but, you know, they, they've talked about, they've talked about um, withdrawing MPs from parliament and, and protests and so on. I think it's very hard to withdraw MPs if you haven't even got a clear majority for independence. Um, and just one last point. I think it's very easy to understand what Keir Starmer is doing in the sense that he not only doesn't want to talk about Brexit and he doesn't want to talk about rejoining the EU and he doesn't want to talk about even rejoining the single market or the customs union and he says he won't do a deal with the SNP, which is pretty outrageous actually. Why not in a federal P PR system, you know, for instance, why wouldn't you? So he's talking to the English constituencies he needs to win the election, but therefore he's completely failing, just as the Tories have more deliberately, failing to engage with Scotland and and that's very clear to any, anyone paying attention, which is a lot of people in Scotland paying attention to UK politics. <laughs> Yeah, I, yes, I'm certainly on that last point. I, I agree entirely. I, I find it extraordinary that the, um, you know, that, that Labour, which has basically got quite a good wicket in the sense of, of uh, you know, obviously, you know, the, the damaging effects of Brexit, I mean, which we can see every day, and they're getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and also the damaging effects of, you know, we're going to be heading for clearly, you know, on November the 17th, we will have what Rachel Reeves has called of austerity season two. Uh, I mean, you know, we're talking about the uh, 50 billion of uh, cuts and or tax rises uh, in, you know, and a repeat of George Osborne's 2010 budget. So uh, I find it astonishing that Labour in that sense, and certainly up here, if it wants to win seats from the SNP, and if it wants to get these 25 seats, which it needs to win back here, you know, uh, the, the only way it seems to me it's going to be is, is, is what a clear way in which it could do so would be to be much more generous towards the idea that if the Scots wish it, Scots meaning people living in Scotland wish it, they could have a, refer a second referendum on independence. And also, I think they have to take a much more robust pro-European view. I mean, I think, you know, they have to follow the, the, you know, the lead given by, for example, here by the Labour movement for Europe. And if they don't do so, I'm afraid, you know, it does, it does seem to me that they will, barring a miracle, they will not get the number of seats they require up here at all. And, you know, the SNP will be <coughs> in a very powerful position in, in Westminster. And Kirsty's right. I don't think Labour can govern in that case I don't see how Labour could govern without actually forming some form of uh, coalition with the SNP and or Liberals, Lib Dems, or yeah. at least some coming come to a cooperation agreement. Thanks. Now, we, we were due to finish this session by now, but we started late, so I think we should carry on for a bit longer. Anybody want to come in? Yes, please. Uh, can I ask David Gow how he would see uh, an upper house in a federal UK, given the Scottish interests, as a federal solution. How would I, sorry? How would you see an upper house in a federal UK? Well, I think I'd say, I personally would, you know, quite like the, uh, as I say, the, the, the German model there of the, uh, of the, of the Bundesrat to being, uh, I mean, the question would be, would, would they be directly elected to the second chamber or would they be uh, a, uh, or would they be drawn from, uh, you know, existing institutions? Uh, like for example, the 32 counties in, um, you know, the 30 councils in, in, in Scotland. I don't know, uh, but, but a, uh, certainly I, I think the, the, you know, the, the, I mean, I find it astonishing that at my, at my age, uh, you know, we're still living with the with the House of Lords, and not only still living with it, uh, we're still living we're, we're living in a period in which it just grows. It grows and grows and grows. I mean, you know, as we know, it's now uh, it's got well over eight hundred people in it. I mean, it's just astonishing. The, the uh, SNP would not go for direct elections, would they? It'd be indirect 
as in the German lender in the Bundesrat. Well, quite possibly, yes. You mean you mean the M MSPs are you talking about, or would you be talking about? Because, uh, of course, as I said earlier, you know, personally, I think a, a unicameral Scottish Parliament is is inadequate. I mean, I think we should move to a to a two chamber system in Scotland as well. But the Bundesrat style out of whatever we call it, second chamber in, in, in the UK would be much, would be smaller, uh, significantly smaller than the, than the body we've now got. Thank you. Um, is a hard border for Scotland becoming a much more attractive proposition for Scots themselves in the light of weaker economics in the UK and a desire to be more Closely linked to Europe. I'd like to come in on that. Um, I think it's quite hard to say it's becoming more attractive. I, I, I think it's it's a challenge. Um, although again, it was interesting in in the pandemic to see, of course, then you know borders around the world. So and in, and in Europe started going back up and, and, and uh, people could see that borders and controls at times could be good. Um, there's sometimes a sort of a mistaken look in the Scottish debate over at Northern Ireland and the protocol and not so much at the, the question of how it's going to be solved as somehow proving that these things can be all right and beneficial um, when obviously the comparator for an independent Scotland in terms of its border with with England and Wales would be Ireland or France or the other EU 27, but especially Ireland, assuming, uh, but it's quite a big assumption, assuming that an independent Scotland could rejoin um, or stay in the common travel area with the rest <coughs> of the UK and Ireland. So that, that actually would really help on some of the border issues because actually you've got a double benefit then, a win-win in the jargon of free movement across the UK and Ireland and free movement across the EU. Um, uh, so I think that side of the border is potentially a positive. Um, and of course, if, if you have a common travel area, you don't have to show your passport at the border. But I, I think um, more neuralgic, perhaps, as, as you, I'm sure you know, if you, if you go to Ireland, you do get asked to show some sort of, sort of photo ID at, at the border at the point of entry. So the idea that you are just going to drive across Scotland, England without England potentially saying show photo ID is, is tricky. I, I think um, not so much the devil in the detail, but the interest is in the, the, the detail here. So when I was doing a paper on this just over a, a year ago, it was intriguing to see that in terms of manufacturing exports, Scotland exports almost the same to the single market, including the EEA. Uh, as it does to the rest of the UK. So the economics of that, if you take down the border to the EU, but, but put one back up to, to England and Wales, um, means manufacturing places in the future are much, much bigger free market being part of the EU single market. It's the opposite on services. Two thirds of Scotland's service uh, exports to the rest of the UK are services. And of course, services didn't do very well in the trade and cooperation agreement. So. I think it comes back to what David Gow was saying about the economics of the argument. If you're to get away from the fact that right now, Scotland exports three times more to the rest of the UK than to the EU, if you're, if you're trying to make independence look like an economic plus, you've got to be able to talk about the overall economic case. You've got to be able to talk about the dynamics, how quickly you'll move your exports to the EU, how quickly you'll attract foreign direct investment, get the benefits of migration. You've got to make an overall case in terms of the border. But I, I think that border is a stumbling block. And just one, one more comment there, on, since we've been talking quite a bit about a possible Labour government. I, I, Keir Starmer's made it clear he would try and ease the trade and cooperation agreement a bit, including the sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Um, and I think well, the irony here is that anything Labour does to ease the border with Europe obviously eases the putative border to an independent Scotland in the, in the EU. And, you know, if, if one looked forward at a scenario of, in my view, it's a very long way off, but if the UK was to rejoin the EU, would you, sitting as a voter in Scotland, 
rather be on David's Bundesrat second chamber, or would we rather be a member state, an equal member state to the UK with a seat and a vote and a voice in Brussels and an open border because we'd all be back in the same internal market? David, do you want to come in on the border? Well, just, well, just on the, I, I think the, I mean, what's the, the argument, uh, just pick up one point that Kirsty was making about talking about, about Ireland, Ireland in particular, since that is, as we say, the lodestar now for it here. If what people <laughs> seems to be that if, if you say that the, as you, you know, that two thirds of Scottish trade goes to the rest of the UK, that is true. But if, if you were, if, if, if independence were associated with membership of the EU and other, and you change them, we'd be talking about an entirely different dynamics. And, you know, just as, for example, I think when Ireland became independent, something like 89% or 90 or whatever it was, of its trade was with, the, was with England. And now it's way below 40%, 30%. I mean, so, and, and, and as interestingly enough, most of the significant change has happened since 1973. It, I mean, in, in, in the kind of from 1921, 22 onwards, you know, the Irish economy did little, little to move or change. And it was the dynamic was injected by membership of the EU. And that has really transformed the Irish uh, thing. And so, as we know, it is now in some ways, on some measurements, second only to Luxembourg in terms of, of um, GDP per capita or national income per capita. It's, it's, it's an astonishing performance. And, and I think there's no intrinsic reason myself why an independent Scotland shouldn't be able to at least pursue some of that dynamics itself. Thanks very much. Um, I think we should draw this session to a close. And I just make one comment, which is that um, how much this debate has moved on as an undergraduate in the early 70s, one of my fellow students, Jim Wallace, was proposing oh, yeah. to Scotland the establishment of the Scottish government, the Scottish Assembly, without much support at that time. Nobody was very interested. Much later in life, he was deputy first minister of Scotland, and now you know one of the big arguments for devolution was well, well, head off those demands for independence. It actually doesn't seem to have done that. Debate moved on. So, would you join me in thanking our speakers? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we didn't hear that, but anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Five, minutes. Five minutes, very short break this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.